So hello, we're back in the Axminster Skill Centre here um, for the continuation of the Spice Rack Cabinet Project. Now, in previous weeks, we have using largely using the router, a bit of bandsaw work as well, I know, shaped the sides of our cabinet. We then did the shelf groove, cutting in these equal height shelves. Remember we made the letterbox jig, made our own jig. Then last week we dovetailed all round. So some really nice fitting half blind dovetails at kind of four inch width and three inch width on all four corners. This week we'll be making the door. We'll be making the frame for the door. So this is a, a finished piece. Here's one I prepared earlier. So we'll be making the profile inscribed raised panel door. All right. So I will just say today we've got Colwyn behind the can uh, behind the camera. Ben is on holiday, so we've taken Colwyn out of his workshop and plonked him into mine to do the filming for us. So I'm blessed. Thank you, Colwyn. No problem. So yes, profile inscribed raised panel door. So we'll be doing the profile first. The profile along the length. And then we'll do the, the scribe with a little tenon to fit into our little groove mortise here to drop in together and make the frame of our door. Next week we'll be raising the panel and maybe a bit of glue up, but for today we're going to make this, this door. The cutters we'll be using is this three-part profile and scribe cutter. Very simple cutter to work with. I know sometimes these maybe have got a, a reputation of being a little complex to get all the grooves aligned, to get all the, the, the spacing right so it fits together snugly. And I find maybe the two part ones are a little bit difficult to work with because you've got to disassemble to do the profile and then reassemble in a different order, put the groover into a different order to, to do the scribe. And sometimes you need to include shims in between these as well not impossible but more difficult with this one all you need to do is you need to machine uh, down along the length uh, along the rail uh, face down and we'll need to do the scribe for that face up with a very subtle adjustment in cutter height so a very simple cutter to work with so let's have a look at how we do that so come on in a bit closer Colin if you can please focus really close in on that router cutter in, in our UJK router table. Okay, so this is the material that we're working with today. These particular cutters, they do have a maximum thickness of material that you can work with, and a minimum. They go from 22 millimeters thick down to 18 millimeters thick. And you've got to work within that range to make to make all, all the grooves and, and the little quirks and the little shape, the little moulding shape come together nicely. We're working on the minimum size of material here. This is 18 millimetre thick tulip wood, cut to 45 mil in, in width here. Um, so we're working on kind of because it's like a mini cabinet, isn't it? It's a mini profile inscribed door. The first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to run down the length of the longer pieces here. So. I'll drop that out of the way. In fact, I'll drop both pieces out of the way because I've got a couple of test pieces, off cuts again from when you machined up your, your, your work pieces. Keep these, they're really good for setup to save making subtle errors maybe on your, uh, on your, on your finished piece. First thing I need to do, I've loaded in the cutter there, you can see I've got my three part profile inscribed tungsten carbide cutter. I've got to set the height of that cutter. I've closed in the aperture, I've closed in the aperture around in the table insert as well, so we've not really got the risk of material dropping in, because this area is really contained, nice and safe. All right. So the first thing I shall do, I'm going to look at setting cutter height. All right. Now if you've done this quite a lot, you may already have a piece that you prepared earlier, that you know is right, and it's really worth keeping this to set up to that piece of material each and every time. Right? But you may not. You may be like this, setting up from scratch. 
So what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you the hints and tips of setting up this style of cutter from scratch without, you know, a previous machine piece to set up too. All right. Okay, I'll just grab one more piece of material. That can be another test piece if I need it. So we're going to go down, down the length of the material first. Now the shape that I'll need to produce, is that about the right kind of area, Colwyn? Perfect. All right. I'm keeping a very close eye on this area here. Because we're working on the, the thinnest material here at 18 mil, if we introduce too much of this quirk, and this quirk here gets too deep, too big, this area here is going to end up a little bit too thin and could be a little bit, little bit vulnerable and a bit um, susceptible to breaking when you're putting the thing together, when you, when you come in to assemble your cabinet door. So this is the area that I'm going to look at. I just want to introduce the part of the cutter that creates this quirk, and I want to just see that. So that is my step one. Now, yeah, I haven't quite got it at the right height. You can see here, this is going to produce the groove. And we're always going, on this particular piece, we're going face down. So you might want to, at this stage, have a look. I know this is the test piece, but you might have a look. There might be a really nice piece of figuring on the grain here that you want to, you want to see, or a blemish or something you want to hide inside the cabinet. So this is going to be the visible face. So we're going to machine this face down. And I'm looking at this here, and I want to just start to see this quirk, this corner come above the table surface. Dropping down, I'm not going to even pick that up. Just got that corner introduced into the material. Right. So I'm going to lock that off and I'm just going to do my test cut. I'm going to pop this material through and just have a look, see whether, see whether we're in the right position. Make sure my fence plates are locked. There we are. Now, what I've done previous to this. This cutter has a bearing on it. Now the bearing's for use if you're doing maybe arched top doors, but it's also a depth stop. Jeez, so you get the, the correct depth into your profile as well. Right, so I just want to make sure that we've got that in the right position. Just want to pull that fence forward a very, very small amount. I'm using the ruler just to make sure that the bearing on the cutter is flush with the fence. Because right, the bearing is acting, as I said, as a, as a depth stop for us. We'll also be using the feather board. Acts as a guard. Covers over the area that, that chips could come out of. And covers over the cutter. But more importantly, really, it gives me downward pressure in this cutting area. I'm using a very, very small piece of material here, and to be honest, I don't really want to put my fingers too close, and I don't want to have to push down, because this is quite a complex profile, this is shape, and any any potential timber lift will affect the overall look of your, um, of, your, of, your, of, your of your door, of your profile. So, just make sure that that's in the correct position. There we go, you can see those fingers just pushing down, just on the material, maybe we're just a little bit tight in that area. You want a little bit of resistance, but you still want to be able to push the material through. That's really good. Okay. And the material is going to be pushed into the fence and then fed through against the rotation of the cutter. So that's what we're going to do first. Okay. Now the speed I've got this cutter at, I haven't wound it up to speed just yet. It should be run around 16,000 RPM. Because we're removing quite a bit of material, I'm definitely going to put my ears on today. Um, but 16,000 RPM is, is kind of the correct running speed for a cutter of this size. This particular router I'm using goes from 10 to 25,000 RPM, so it's kind of halfway along the dial for the speed. And it's important for a cutter of this size that you, when you're getting big, you adhere to those speeds. Because some of the cutters, like the one we'll be using next week, is 
large. And we really want to get that speed right. Feel like a helicopter taking off if you try and run this cutter. This uh, size of cutter flat out straight away. And I think good practice as well is when you change cutters on the router, wind the speed down to zero straight away, and then bring that cutter up to speed gradually. So there's no there's no shocks, there's no surprises with a cutter of this size jumping at the right speed because you, you forgot to dial it back. Good safety tip, that one. Okay, so extraction is on. I'm going to bring that cutter speed up just gently. Now, you'll see that even with this, I didn't want to get my hands still too close to the material. I, there's a number of pushing devices that you could use for this. There's a, a push stick, there's the little push blocks, the little factory made push blocks, or there's a little homemade one that we've made here, which works really well for this small stuff. Literally, sits into that corner, and you've got the ability, you haven't got to push down because this is pushing down for you, so you've not got the risk of getting too close to the cutter with your fingers. And you can slide on through with some real control. Okay, let's have a look where we're at. How's that view, Colin? Is that about right? Yeah, that's good. Can you see? Just back a little bit. Oh, oh let me. Yeah, is yeah. Is that good? Perfect. So this is this little quirk I was talking about. You just want to introduce that, and I think that's just about right. If I want to increase this to get a little bit more detail in this area, well, I'd change the cutter, I'd lift the cutter up, but then, as said, I've got the risk of this area ending up to be just a little bit too thin. All right, so as it is, I'm really happy with that. If you're working with thicker material, then you've got more material to play with. All right, you haven't got to worry too much about this area snapping with it, uh, during assembly. So we've got that quirk, which runs the full length of the material here. We've got a really nice, clean, kind of, it's what's called a lamb's tongue profile. It's like a flattened, squashed letter S. Very common, very traditional sort of style, this one. A very clean groove, six millimeter groove, this one. And a little bit of strength left there. So, I'm actually really happy with that as a, as a first cut. So, I'm gonna go and put my other pieces through, just like this. On the floor. Work all the way along a lovely clean groove a smooth profile and it's important I think to come off a router or come off a shape cutter be it spindle mold or router with no no sanding involved very very difficult to sand this shape and profile without losing some of the detail that's on there so given the speed right good quality and sharp cutters are critical and there we are we have the two sides of our cabinet door done we now we need to focus on the these bits. Right. But first I need to just take a measurement. So pop that over there. I need to bring my cabinet in. A nice easy way. Yes you can measure it. But for, for ease. Now this cabinet isn't glued but I know if it's squashed together. Remember when we did the dovetailing last week if all the dovetails are seated in then it finds its own square. Yeah, that one goes in there, that one goes there. And now all I need to do is take a measurement between these two quirks, because that's going to be the length that I'm going to cut these off to. All right, now I know what it is normally. We've made quite a few of these cabinets over the years in here. All right, and that 
that's good. I need to chop that off at one, three, five. So I'm going to hit up the table saw now. So Colin's going to, going to pan round for me. And I'm going to cut these two bits down to length so we can start machining these to, to fit into the bits that we've just done. So we're over to the table saw and we've got the, uh, the sliding carriage which has been set really square to the blade. It is quite a small piece so we need to make a good conscious effort of keeping an eye where our fingers are. Okay, But it's still a safe cut in my opinion. So I just need to make a dimension, make a, make a measurement and then we'll introduce our flip stop for our material to come against so we're um, we're cutting both pieces the same length. Now that was a one three four, wasn't it, Colin? Five. One three five. Oh. I was listening. Goldfish. <laughs> the memory. The memory. Now the machine is completely off. It's switched off of the wall and isolated. So don't go diving into your your saw blade like this, lifting guards up um, to set it up with potentially um, a live machine. All right. So I introduced the rule and one three five on this side of the blade, just on the tungsten tip. I'm bringing in my flip stop. It just, just touches the ruler. I'm locking off, double checking at 135. Beautiful. Guard drops down, ruler's out of the way. And this is gonna be popped through, just like that. Just nibbling off the end, taking me, taking my, um, my rails down to the right length. So, a bit of distraction. Perfectly square. I'm coming back round. Really square, clean rails. Okay, perfectly square and clean, which is important on all kind of machinery like uh, machining like this. That your material you're using is, is clean, it's square, it's easier to work with. Right, if we can pan back round, Carl, we'll then go back to the router table. Just gonna. Make some changes. I'm just going to check the length of this. See if that drops in. And that is perfectly. Generally, when I make a door like this, I'm going to make the door slightly oversized, ever so slightly, probably a millimeter all round. Because if you want it to fit into this aperture, you've kind of got to plane it in, plane it down to size. Um, you've got to remember that this cabinet isn't even glued up yet. So I'm giving myself a mill all round just to skim it down so it can fit in here because it's going to sit inside fit in here perfectly so let's take these out of the way for the moment I'll remove my test piece because we don't need that one cabinet drops on there well, off of the wall because i'm going to dive into the cutter a little bit here Oops. or i'm done So we need to machine the end of the rails. Knobs falling off cover. Better. All right. So we need to machine down the length and we need to machine the ends. Generally you want a piece like this, you'll machine the ends first. Because when you're machining across any grain, there's a real strong chance of getting breakout here. And you don't want that to be on your final piece, visible breakout along the profile. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna machine the ends, and then we're gonna come back and machine down the length again. Now, I know a lot of people will, and it, I think it's probably good practice if you've, if you've done a lot of this sort of thing, you know the setup on your cutter height. Maybe you've got a piece you've done before. You can machine all of the ends first and then go down the length of all the pieces. Um, but I find just to get a good eye on the profile, 
and a good visibility of what that shape needs to look like, it's good to go down the length first. Just gives you a better angle on, on what's going to happen. So let me just offer up a piece that I've prepared earlier. All right. Now we need to machine this. Now everything we've done is face down. We need to machine face up. But we need to cut across the grain here on a very small, very narrow piece of material. Now, trying to slide that through like that is impossible. Near impossible. It's not going to stay square through. It's going to kick over a little bit. It's going to be difficult. Probably not going to be all that safe either. Face down. These bits are machined face up. We could use, if you have one, and I know a lot of people do, we could use a, a mitre fence. Right. It drops into track. Nothing wrong with that. You could mitre fence, and that helps you stay square. Doesn't clamp or grip, but it does stay square. Nothing wrong with that at all. But as I've got the, uh, the luxury of it, I'm going to introduce, I'm going to use one of these. Mm -hmm. Just going to take this out of the way. There we are. Now this is a coping sled. It's like a giant mitre fence. But there's clamps involved where the material can come in and actually get clamped in position to be machined. Everything's fixed and rigid. There's no risk of movement on these on these small pieces of material because they are difficult to hold. We've got a fence that we run against. And we'll be sliding through just like that with our material in position. So I'm going to set up this cutter now. Now all I need to do is adjust the cutter height. I've got extra thickness here, my material's on this, so we need to take that in, in, into consideration because we've been on the table before, but we're actually on this, on this platform on the coping sled now. Um, I could, again, use a piece that I've done before, but I'm not going to do that. What we're going to do is use the piece that we've just machined to set up. We need to align this gap here this gap here is going to produce I have it out. We're going to produce that tongue. Right. Remember, we're going face up this time. It was face down before, so that's what makes these cutters pretty easy to work with. Is it's face up or face down, and a subtle height adjustment. So no disassembly of this. No taking the shims out. This creates the groove, uh, sorry, the tongue. This has just created the groove in, in the other piece that we've just machined. This is going to create the, 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 the tongue as well as the, the counter profile to drop over here. But before I make adjustments to this cutter, I, I'm just going to take a reading so I can quickly and easily come back to my setting once I need to go again. And I'm just going to use this just to drop on so when I adjust my cutter I can come back to this each time I can stay at that so where are we there we are I'm just gonna pop my material in and always the best view is down the length here so you might just see the back of my head for a minute or two alright and I need just a some subtle adjustments. This is where you know the, the beauty of a, a router with a fine height adjuster comes in. There we go. Now I don't know whether you can quite see that Colwyn, but we've got in here we've aligned these gaps actually. We've aligned the grooves and that's a good way to because this is going to produce a tongue to drop into this groove. So it's a really quick and easy way to set up just align these two grooves. This producing the tongue to drop into this groove after. I'm happy with that height setting for the moment. Bear in mind this is a test piece. You might just need to make some tweaks, some changes afterwards. Normally, most routing, 
It doesn't matter if your fence isn't running straight and square to your mitre fence slot or it's kicked over at an angle because you're running down the length. This is one of the few applications where I make sure that my fence is in line with my mitre fence slot because I'm using the fence as kind of a, a, a depth stop, as a register. And because I'm using a mitre fence slot in conjunction with my fence, they've got to be in line. Everything's got to be parallel. And it's a simple thing to do. All we need to do is just measure between these two points here and at the back here and just make sure it's the same. We're still making sure that our bearing is in line with our fence, but our, our, our fence itself runs parallel with our mitre fence slot. That's it, it's sort of the, the very few times that we need to do that. So I'll drop my material in. I'm going to call my test marking there, the, the face up and not face down. I'm actually going to put just a little marker on my fence, just there, as a register point. So up against the back fence, up against my register point, I'm going to lock it off. Just that clamp there, because I've got it gripped. There's two clamps on something like this, if you're in longer lengths, but as we're very short lengths here, we can only introduce one of these clamps. So I'm going to slide this plate over, which is going to help me just in case we get a little pivot in the cut. We shouldn't. I'm really confident with this clamping, but it's a belt and braces sort of job, but just in case. All right. I've adjusted the cutter height. We know the speed's right. My fence runs parallel with my mitre fence slot. I've got a positive register to hit my fence and lock in. I'm ready to go. Okay, let's see what we've got. with this I slid all the way through out the other side of the car. There's a couple of ways you could do that I think. What we don't want is you to slide through and then when the cutter's running drag it back through because it could catch the cutter, twist your material and maybe knock your fence out of line so it's always I think a practice to go through and out. Right. Let's have a look what we've got. We can use our test piece. Right so we can see there that we've got that particular that kind of opposite shape to that. Now, instantly, it doesn't look perfect to me. This area here looks really skinny. And this area, this bit, has got to be equal to this little quirk that we uh, paid attention to on our initial setup. And you can see what I mean about the breakout. We're going to machine down that edge in a minute to remove the majority of that breakout. But let's have a look. Does that drop in? Well, it goes in beautifully. Well, we know, I knew it would. However, alignment isn't quite right. If you look at that, that goes in there. Great. But we've got a step here. We've got a step there. And that tells me cutter height isn't quite right. I've kind of removed too much material in this area. I need to recut, but I need to drop the timber down. Uh, sorry, the cutter down the very smallest amount. As we're looking to be completely flush in this area. So that's what I will do. Subtlest of movements. Okay. It's probably about half a millimetre I've moved there. It's not a great deal. And we've not got a lot of room for movement because we've you won't be able to machine the same area twice. You've got to flip the end around, do the other end. Keep it the same orientation so you get used to the, the face up, face down thing. And this is being machined face up. The subtlest of movements. And as I said, because we're working on very the, the thinnest material available, we've got to get this just right. Because there's not going to be too much uh, timber left if we start stand, sanding away those corner joints. Uh, to, to correct any correct any, any steps that are on. And that's 
going in just the same way. Okay. There's a tiniest little step there. That's not a lot, and you know, there's a the, you could probably sand that off, but for this video, we want it perfect, don't we? So let's just adjust that cutter down. It's a whole reason we do test pieces on something like this, so we don't go straight into you know machining our expensive material, and you know they're not quite right. Again, I'm just going to move that cutter down the smallest amount. Now I'm confident I'm not even going to do another test piece now. I'm confident that's going to be spot on. So I'm going to machine the ends. So I've got four cuts to do. I'm going to machine all four ends. I've cut them to length. I know. It's better. I'm mixed up on the test pieces. I've cut them to length. I know they're clean and square and ready to go. Okay. Let's load that in. Uh, the testing, the, the kind of setup does maybe seem a little bit long winded. However, once you, like a lot of things, so certainly like the dovetailing last week, spend a bit of time doing the setup. But once the setup's there, you know, you can rattle these off really quite quickly. <laughs> There we have our pieces machined. Okay, see the ends. So let's see how we fit. Goes in there nicely. Goes in there nicely. Drops in there. We can see that corner. Is that just about right? Comes together nicely, locks in, flush here, flush at the back, and there's no gaps there. So, a really nice joint that one. Very happy. One thing we've got to do is put the profile in down here because our panel has got to drop into this groove, and there's, there's nothing here for it to drop into. We need to make some subtle adjustments realign the cutter and just drop that in and that will be our final piece so we'll do that put those out of the way don't need the sled anymore that is finished with okay i need to bring this cutter back to the height where i had it where i went down the length i've got this particular device here which is going to help me do it just needs to come up to that position. And this could be something simple as a pencil mark on a bit of wood. But if you've got some measuring equipment like this, maybe it's just a little bit more precise. Okay. Now, remember which way round. These pieces now need to be face down. All right. So you need to see these little rebates as your machining, it's got to be like that, face down. I'm going to put my feather ball back on, so it's going back to our original setup. Slide 
fluids on through. And the featherboard's generally are kind of halfway through the cutter. A little bit more of that end, a little bit more pressure, not too much. There we go. That's probably too much, you said that. Now you've got an extremely small piece of material we're putting through a rather large cutter. So it's even more important we use some sort of pushing device. down so you need to see these rebates facing up. Yeah, so we'll do that. That's profiled all around there. Right, so that drops in. That one drops in. View from the back. Drops in. Drops in. So we've got the framework for our profile and scribe raised panel door. Just got to raise the panel out to get this uh, to get this door to fit. One more cut to do, however. This door, you can probably clearly see, isn't going to fit in this aperture here. So we need to take a measurement of this here, and it's just a simple cut along the length, uh, sorry, a, a, a cross cut through here to bring this door down to size because of course this can drop in at any point along here to give us the correct door height. Right, so I'll slice these off here at some point. So that is just about all we've got time for on the the making the frame, the profile inscribed door frame. Next week we'll be raising the panel. Now this panel we've got to make fit inside our door here. All right. Oops. The cutter we'll be using, like I said previously, is a large lamb's tongue again. So you've got that kind of matching profile, that very traditional flat and squashed S kind of shape and profile and we'll be using that to create our panel. But that's next week. At the same time, four o'clock here in the Skill Center. Thank you for watching. As always, if you've got any questions, please post them. We'll do our very best to answer them. And don't forget to tune in to Colwyn's video tomorrow at four o'clock. What are we doing tomorrow, Colwyn? Oh, uh, what are we doing? Oh, pens part three. Oh, a three. So that's more complex pens, I presume. Pens part three, uh, it is, yeah. We got a fountain pen with a little notched cap in. And we're doing a coffee bean blank with the Empress pens. Oh, nice. Workshop smelling a coffee. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Well, please tune in for that. And thank you for watching this one. Um, we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. Bye now.